they will do today is go with the man-to-man -man defense. Laundry rolling to his left slightly sets up. And again, Cantrell's a little bit behind Canberra. Canberra has inside position as you watch them jockey for a spot here on the goal line. Looks like Cantrell comes with a little push, makes the catch and steps out. The flag is thrown though, and it is against Cantrell. That's the thing about Cantrell, John. He's got big size. It's six foot 190, 195, pretty big guy here. And uh, he takes advantage of that size when he goes down in those patterns. And uh, we've already seen in two plays so far where he's pretty much used his physical advantage to his ability. He has. And again, uh, Canberra's at a disadvantage also in that they're playing a man-to-man -man defense. This is something that Plymouth expected today, that Bridgewater would go with a man defensive secondary, and they are doing that. That leaves Cantrell your number one choice because of his upper body strength. Plymouth is going to try and take advantage of the pass in the flat, but what that does with man-to-man -man coverage, it allows that break that could set up the long one. Again, Cantrell's going to be the go-to guy often today. Well, the other thing, Plymouth likes to flood those with three, four, five receivers out there, four receivers, and that puts a lot of pressure on the guys who are deep. Okay, Plymouth at the 50-yard line, lost it down, third and 22 yards, 21 yards to go. Laundry back to pass again, right in his flat to Fountain, and uh, he gets it up over about the 35-yard line. It's going to bring up a fourth and maybe, let's call it nine. Laundry with a quick two-step drop. Again, something they'll be doing to take advantage of Bridgewater's aggressiveness. Take another look at it. With the 4-4 set, Bridgewater's going to be coming after the ball constantly, which forces Landry to that quick two-step drop. Sees Fountain cutting across the middle. No time for the defensive pressure to hit the quarterback. Laundry, he hits Fountain inside for the game. Okay, here we are. Laundry in the shotgun. Looks like going to be a quick kick to Friedman. That's exactly what they're doing. And he kicks it straight up in the air. And it's not even going to get the first down as it goes out of bounds on the far <laughs> sideline at about the 30-yard line. And uh, that's not how they drew it up on the on the uh, the chalkboard, John. Took an awful long time unfolding. If you're going to go with the quick kick or the pooch kick, you've got to get the ball away quickly. Took too long, and they even have gotten a piece of it on the deflection. And well, the other thing is, once you see that, I mean, it's not really uh, overly de deceiving. I'll take a look at that in a second. Bob Winden, at quarterback, he, he is the guy who leads the veer. They're going to break out, but... Uh, New, uh, I knew I was going to blow that one. Let's <laughs> come back after first and 10 on the 30-yard line for uh, Bridgewater. They're coming out in the veer. Here they go on the option. And a fumble right off the play. John Morley down there, number 42. And uh, who else do we have down there in the bottom of the pile? Don't think it was Morley. Looks like it might have been Adams Hawks on the play. Got a little, re little reprieve on setting the offense for uh, Bridgewater there. That's the thing that's plagued Bridgewater so far. 18 fumbles coming in to today's ball game, and that team's an option play, especially on a wet field. That's a problem. It is a problem. It's very much like the wishbone, and that's a fumble-prone offense. Bridgewater's made up for it in the past. Now their defense is against the test from the 30-yard line. Okay, we're going to start. Plymouth gets the first break of the ball game. Bost is in the game with the tailback. Wachelons in the in the H-back slot. And here it goes to Wachelons. Oh, in and out of his hands. At the 25-yard line, Rochelle's usually a very good, dependable receiver. Just out of his hands, as we said, Plymouth working the flat early, trying to get the ball out there, take advantage of Laundry's mobility. A couple of steps to the side, and he's able to dump it in there. It gets him away from the Bridgewater linebackers. They've got four guys back there with the 4-4 set, and they will send them. Okay, three guys to the left-hand side. Cantrell is out there. Rochelle's is in the slot. Single back is Bost. Long count. Here comes the first running play. This is Bost. It's inside, takes it up over the 25 to about the 24-yard line. Going to bring up about a third and five situation. David George and Tony Reddington out front leading the play, leading the play for Bost. First running play from scrimmage, as you said, Dave. Laundry with a quick pitch back here. Gets Bost on the run to his strength. Ball probably would rather be on the other hand, but he follows his block as well and takes advantage of the fact that Bridgewater may be backpedaling, looking for the pass, third down. Plymouth has got uh, water, goes out of the game. Carlo is back in, he's to the right. Boss stays in the game. Third and five. Long count by Laundry. once again. Short drop, throws it through the hands of Cantrell. Nice play by uh, Gary Camber, who has been one-on-one -on -one with Cantrell, and they've had their number of duels already, John. Camber is getting pressure today. The one-on-one -on -one guy, as you said, David, he's made seven solo tackles so far this year with 11 assists. He really hasn't had much luck defensively. He's got one interception through six games. He'll have plenty of opportunities today, however, if Plymouth keeps working Cantrell. Just underway, 12.33 in the ball game. We're at Plymouth State College. Plymouth on the 24-yard line, fourth and five. Friedman, the deep back. Nine guys up in the line, of, ten guys in the line of scrimmage for Bridgewater. And here comes the roll. Laundry with some room. Pulls it down to Cantrell, 
hit him right in the shoulder pads, popped out, and it falls incomplete. Been a problem so far, John, for Cantrell. He's averaging over 20 yards a game and had some big plays, but on the other side, he has dropped his share. It's been kind of a roller coaster. Laundry rolling against his strength now. Going, uh, pardon me, going against his throwing arm. Gets a nice block from Friedman that set him up. Cantrell could it in the shoulder pad. I think looked like he may have taken his eye off for a second, seeing the defender coming. Again, a ball that could have been caught on the sidelines. Instead, Plymouth turns it over. Bridgewater with a first down at the 24. As Bob Trumpy would say, he should have had that one. <laughs> okay. Bridgewater comes out, second chance fumble on their first attempt at taking the Veer up against Plymouth, trying to run it inside. That's Plymouth's weakness. Two guys in the backfield. And they're right off tackle. They start big battle. Looks like it was uh, John Como took the, took the ball as uh, he went in there. Good defense. The green wall held that time. Take a look at the defense. Dan Tappan, Adams Hawks, and John Barry, the wall up front. The four linebackers in the 3-4 configuration. Bob Willison, Toby Cloutier, John Morley, and Jeff Jarry here. Uh, those are the leading two tacklers in the backfield. P.J. Hansen, Mike Giard, Matt Caraciola, and Ryan Cole back after not starting last week up front. Actually, check that. They've made a change already. But uh, here we go with the Vera. Once again, they're attacking the middle. Plymouth has made a change, John, to kind of shore up the middle because they've been giving up over 200 yards a game rushing this year, and Bridgewater, on, conversely, has done the same thing, 200 yards a game. What Plymouth has done is go away from their traditional 5-2 defense they've run this year, going with a 5-3. What they've done is they brought Mike Giard, the cornerback, up to a linebacker slot. He and Cluder will be on the outside, and John Morley in the middle. Morley's a bigger guy, maybe a little bit less mobile, but very good against the run. They hope to keep the veer from the outside of the field, make them run it inside, and let Morley use his strength to slow him down. And Bruce DeVito was in in place of Ryan Cole. He is, again, a guy who's a little bit specialized in the run. On a third down and about six yard, jumped off, somebody jumped off, number uh, 99, Mark Roper, was in there a little bit too early, and the field is littered with <laughs> yellow pa yellow uh, material and laying down there. Jeff Jerry took advantage of the miscue, whosoever it was, and got a nice clean shot at the running back. Uh, Jerry took him down in the backfield, but it looks like the play will be stepped off against Plymouth. And it's going to go to third and one. Ball's going to set start off at the 33. Got to make it to about the 34 and a half yard line. Mark Took Roper a look at Mark Roper there. I'd like to get uh, the graphic put up there on the screen. It's a little bit of a different manner, but... You may see that photo next on a post office wall if that play turns into a big one for Bridgewater State. <laughs> Third and one, 11-01 left in the ball game. They're set in the veer, one wide out to the left. Back to pass, Gwinden throws deep. He's wide open and uh, went out of bounds. And that's Piccioli, or Piccioli, was uh, had two or three steps out there on the side as Plymouth went to the man-to-man -man situation. Hanson really was caught on that one when Piccioli turned it upfield. One thing that was going to happen, Plymouth is focusing so heavily on the run, the corners the, the corners have to be really careful. We see, uh, take a look at Piccioli there, the senior from Natick, Massachusetts, uh, who was unable to pull in that floated pass, forcing Bridgewater to the punt. Holds the all-time record for a touchdown catch by uh, Bridgewater for a touchdown, 83 yards uh, for a TD, and there goes the punt, and we're going to uh, GR. He's got it about the 30, and uh, avoids one tackler, <laughs> but not the next nine, <laughs> as he goes down in a hail of bodies, uh, right on top of the Jason LeBlanc, number 40. There's one of the guys who were in there, and so many people running off the field, it's tough to see who else was there. Well, Mike GR looked up, and it looked like a Bridgewater State team photo coming at him on that one. The only uh, person for sure that wasn't there was uh, Peter uh, Massaferro, the coach. <laughs> of Bridgewater is in his 24th year. Okay, Plymouth comes out, full house backfield. Now they're going to shift out of it. Thing looked like a subway stop. Everybody running in different directions. Here's Friedman at the 35. No where to go. Three sets of bodies there. The first guy, number 56, is in on the play from the Bridgewater leading tackler for Bridgewater, Eric Arthur. Check that. He's not the leading tackler, the leading sack man, but uh, he has got 12 sacks in six games, and that far and away that's twice as many as the Plymouth team had. They have five, only five sacks this year, and that's been a problem for Plymouth. Eric Arthur, as you see there, the junior from Milford, Massachusetts. Uh, also, 15 of his tackles have been for losses, David, so he's very good at getting into the opponent's backfield. Okay, Laundry back to pass in the flat to Cantrell. Once again, over the 40, about the 43-yard line, brought down by Scott Bernier. And uh, that time they shifted Cantrell off to the other side. That was the carbon copy of the player where he dropped the pass. It would have been a uh, 
first down for Plymouth kept that drive alive, but now this takes up the third and maybe that long three. The under game seems to be working for Plymouth. They're taking that seven and eight yard pickup in the flat. Carlo and Cantrell are coming out to the left. The shells in the, in the uh, H-back slot. Third and three. Long count by Landry. Here we come. This is Friedman over the 45, the 50. Cuts back. Typical Matt Friedman run as he takes it all the way up to the 40 of the Bears. Picks up Plymouth's first first down. Nice running by nice running by Friedman on that play. Let's take another look at this one here. Again, Plymouth going to the run, one of the few times they have today with the pitch to Friedman. The pitch gets him away from the action quicker, lets him read the block, which he does. But once he makes the penetration through the line, it's all him. He leaves defender uh, Eric Lee lying on the ground and then pulls away, and it took that last-minute effort by Bernier to keep him from breaking that one. And that really is where he's at his best when he's cutting back against the grain. Okay, laundry right back to the pass in the flat, and it is uh, Carlo, I believe. He's driven down number uh, 45. Eric Lee atones for the last play, makes the tackle on about the 37-yard line. And uh, check that, it was it was uh, John Dalton in the game instead of Carlo. Gotta get those 13s and 18s, they all look alike to me. Nashua High School Band here performing at uh, Plymouth State College. It's Parents' Day, by the way. Okay, second down and about, uh, they've got eight in the scoreboard. I'll dispute that, I think it's seven. Here we have Carlo, he's in motion to the right. Singles back set. And they're going to run against the grain to the left. Here's Boss over the 40. And uh, he goes down. Got some great numbers. Gary King, the linebacker. Great number for a linebacker, number nine. And uh, he makes the play, but uh, that didn't fool anybody. Well, I'd like to tell everybody that that play was a sweep, but I don't think it's necessary. We're sitting in front of a group of uh, Bridgewater fans who made the call, the sweep call. Uh, Gary King, the linebacker from Canton, Massachusetts. Think, uh, they're making the tackle on the play. I think uh, the problem is everybody in Plymouth thought that sweep was going to the right. Because <laughs> there was no, only green shirt over there was Bost, and he remains in the ball game. This time with Shones is off to the right, two wideouts. Dalton stays in the game. At the at the, or is back in the game, number 13. First time we've seen him this year. Laundry short drop, immediate, and there he is on the sack. He goes down. The sack master, Eric Arthur, was in there on the shot, number 56, reminiscent of a couple other 56s we've seen playing down these parts. Untouched. Take a look at this again. Laundry looking for the quick drop, just about to set, and you see Arthur fire through here. Nobody on him. Laundry turns around, gets a nice close look at Eric Arthur before he's thrown to the ground. And, and he, he had a man wide open. Yeah, it was Shellens off there in the flat. Okay, fourth down into punt. They've switched Brian Cole now in the game punting. And he goes for the coffin corner, but uh, a little bit short. Probably went out about the 24. Looks like they're going to mark it uh, where the 19-yard line. So got it inside the 20. Ryan Cole has not has been punting lately. Originally, it was Mike Giard who started the season as a punter. And I said Giard was the first guy I've seen, first defensive back punter I've seen since Yale Larry was playing in the 50s. But now we've got another one, Ryan Cole, defensive back, strong safety for the Panthers. Okay, no score here, 7.04 left in the first period. Bridgewater State, Plymouth State at Courier Memorial Field here in the campus of Plymouth State College. Back to the Vair, we got a penalty flag right back up through the middle. And uh, so far, Plymouth's done a good job. That was Nguyen on the uh, on the carry, number 34. But uh, I think we're going to get, it looks like an illegal procedure play for me. Looks like Keith Ferrara got in there and made the initial hit for the Plymouth defense. Plymouth being very aggressive here. I think one of the problems, Dave, is they may have been way too passive in the opening moments of games so far this season. They just haven't been getting out there and holding teams. They're being heavily outscored first period of some of these games. They've got to be a lot more aggressive. And they've also made a change in the defense. As we mentioned earlier, they went to that five-man front to see if they could uh, slow down the veer and take away that first option. If you take that away, then that uh, really doesn't allow you to set up that outside uh, that outside uh, pitch as well. Gwindin brings them up over center. Two guys in the backfield. Nguyen remains in the ball game. Here we're coming left. Chris Khalil, and he takes it up over about the 24-yard line. And uh, after probably going to be up to about a third and uh, seven situation, Khalil, of course, has got the big 7.7 .7 yards of carry, and uh, that indicates usually one thing, John, a lot of speed. And it may be necessary to the Bridgewater effort today because Dwayne Greenidge is out with a sprained ankle, so we won't see him. Puts a lot of pressure on Khalil, who takes the pitch in the deep in his own end here, sidesteps a couple of tackles, shakes a couple. They've been critical, the Plymouth staff has, of the Plymouth State tackling, and you can see why in that case he broke a few. 
a little bit of sloppy work by the Plymouth defense. Okay, both uh, Nguyen and Khalil stay in the ball game. Now they're going to come left immediately to the pitch. Nguyen has got some room, but he's running into three guys zone. He takes it out on about the 27-yard line. Good pursuit on the plate. DeVito, Jarry was down there. Morley was down there. And uh, Plymouth uh, gang tackling. Uh, Cloutier was also, Toby Cloutier was one of the guys there. One more look at this here again. We're going to the pitch, which gives that back a chance to see the see the blocking unfold. Nguyen tucks it under. He's got Khalil out there in front of him. Follows the block, takes it up the sideline toward the marker. He knew where he had to go for the first down, but he still came up about two yards short, leaving them with what? Third and two? And actually, that was John Como, number 24, is in the game from Nguyen. Third and one. And they go right back to Como, and he takes it up all for the first down, about the 32-yard line. Just kept those legs pumping. Como, normally not a starter, but uh, he is is uh, the leading touchdown maker for Bridgewater. So what they like to do is just wear you out, run guys in and out. And uh, they have, in fact, survived the loss of their leading running back, Clint Cabral, uh, who early in the year had appendicitis, which hap I guess is the injury of the year in the little small college football. Okay, first and 10 from the 32-yard line. Como and Khalil remain in the game. And they go to Como. Pounds out a nice gain right up the gut off left guard. He takes it up over the 35 to about the 37-yard line. Good work by Antonio Andros, number 77. Andrews, that is. And the, as they continue to pound the win, try and set up the outside, get the yards on the inside, and then set it up to the outside. A lot of vocal support on the sidelines from the Bears reserves as they cheer on their teammates here 456 remaining in the first period Earl Johnson now in the game for the first time he's split wide to the right Brady in the slot and a last minute pitch to Como as he goes down nice job by uh, Gindin who uh, was hit as he was about to pitch the ball it was heads up play Chris Healy number 56 on the tackle Chris Healy almost took the ball out of Gwyndon's hand on that play. He had good penetration. One thing you want to do is use those linebackers to try and keep things, stringing them out, not letting them get around that corner. He almost took the pitch and went the other way with it. Instead, Bridgewater with a third and three. Third and four here with about four minutes to go in the first quarter. No, no score. And now uh, we've got an illegal procedure play there. Somebody jumped off. Looked like on the left-hand side of the Bridgewater line. But uh, three yellow hankies down there on the floor. Bridgewater's walking backwards, so uh, they're going to mark it off. And those are the kind of mistakes that really hurt because that was a, a third and two situation. Make that a third and four situation. Now we're going to take it back to third and nine and not the situation. A team that runs four, uh, three or four to one on their offense and... Uh, they really need the run to set up their passing game to get it going. And uh, in this case, it's really just a straight pass, so it gives Plymouth a little bit of an advantage. Earl Johnson's flanks wide to the left. Brady is in the slot. Here we go, Gwyndon rolling to the right, and he is looking intercepted by Giard, and it looked like it was going to Giard as he got it at about the 47 and went right out of bounds at about the 46-yard line. So Bridgewater has their second turnover here in the first half, and Plymouth defense doing the job. Mike Giard there, as you see, as we watch Gwynn roll to his left, trying to find a receiver downfield. He's thrown three interceptions so far this season. He just kind of looks downfield, almost as if the throw were intended for Giard, who's just thrown behind the receiver. Giard takes it out of bounds at the Bridgewater 47, where the Panther offense will set up shop. Okay, Friedman stays in the backfield again. Wide side of the field is the left. Short drop. He's going long. It's to Cantrell. It looked like a hold going down the sideline. No call. We're on the far side of the field, but almost looked like a pickpocket. But uh, no call. Who was that? Gary Camber, I think, on that, on that side, uh, on the right side. Oh, check that. Scott Bernier. Nice job by the Plymouth offensive line, uh, particularly Chris McMahon, who managed to keep Eric Arthur out of Paul Laundrie's face so he could take that pass with the long drop. Okay, Fountain is in the ball game, replacing Carlo. Cantrell in the slot. Nine guys inside the 40-yard line, second and 10, goes to Friedman. And he has nowhere to go. Tackled by Jim Koska, one of the guys in there. And uh, who else do we have in there? Eric Leet. And uh, Tom Black, number 99, try captain. Check that. For some reason, I get Black and Gary King mixed up. Gary King, of course, is the tri-captain, but uh, 
Okay, Plymouth uh, in a situation, again, an unenviable situation. Third and 10 from the 47-yard line. Two wideouts way to the right. Ball right in the middle of the field. Carlo is in motion. Back to pass, gonna roll right. Good pressure. And throws it deep downfield, and with Shells, it's wide open, and it just hung up there. And he really, and there's a penalty flag. Really a late penalty flag. I don't know what that could be. Uh, helpless feeling for Wachelens as he's waiting for the ball to come down to him. It took a real nice move by Laundry to get away from Tom Black. As you watch here, he'll roll to his to his left. His strong side avoids the uh, effort by Black, and he has to hang it up there to avoid the tackler. Wachelens is just parked under it, almost like a center fielder waiting. Three Bridgewater defenders converge at the same time, and it looks as though number 42, Lou Garcia, may have got a hand in there. That may have been the origin of the call. We'll wait while the official walks it off and see precisely what this is. Number 10, Casey Linder was also in there on the play. And uh, three guys right there. And really, Wachelns did a nice job coming out of that H-back slot, just kind of slid behind everybody. I guess they didn't, they didn't think that big body, 220 pounds, is going to get down the field that deep. But uh, that's exactly what the personal foul. Must have been the late hit. Linder late coming hit, yeah. in from the far side, but uh, I don't see how he could avoid it getting in the middle of that pileup. But anyway, Plymouth will take it. They're at the 31, first and 10, 254 left in the first period. And Fountain is in motion. Cross to the right. Pitch to Faust. Avoids one guy, and here comes another horde of players. Does a nice job taking it up to about the 26 yard line. And. Uh, yeah, good, help, good help by Tony Reddington on that play. You saw Boss read the block. I think he wanted to go outside. Reddington had two of the Bears defenders stacked up, had them immobilized pretty much, so Boss cut it back inside and managed to get a four-yard gain out of it. The outside linebacker, Jim Costa. Taking a look at it again. Charge. Boss looks at the block, sees it, and decides to cut back. And since Reddington had everybody pinned, took it inside for the four-yard pickup. It'll be second and six. And Eric Leap also was in on the play. I love that. I, I just love uh, Gary King is the guy. I just of, love number nine as a linebacker. Great memory. Maybe you keep thinking Sonny Jurgensen playing back there. Here's the pitch to Boss. And he is grabbed in the backfield by Arthur. Eric Arthur, who looks a lot like uh, Andre Tippett kind of charging through there. He's got a lot of mobility as a defensive end. Watch the quickness. This is the third time he's been in the backfield. He's standing up. And he just kind of chases the play down. And he uses his quickness back of the shoulder pads. Slows the play up, and the uh, pursuit is there. Number 45, Eric Lee, once again doing the job. And we should point out that Eric Arthur is six foot three, 240 pounds. He is no lightweight. You know, he looks like looks like Charles Haley. He's big. He's tall and lean. You can't see him. He doesn't look 240 to me. It's, uh, laundry back to pass in the flat, and there's Cantrell on the one knee for the first down at the 15 yard line. Probably marked uh, half a yard back. Although we have a penalty flag down, and we do have somebody down in the field. Looks like Arthur holding. Either his ankle, looks like he's holding his right ankle. He got cut on a blocking situation. He was stopped by one man, and while he was pretty much in a hand fight with that one blocker, he got cut. I'm not sure who it was. Maybe we can catch a look at it here. Let's watch, let's take another look at this play, see if we can find out what happened to Eric Arthur. Laundry in the drop. Of course, Arthur will be coming from the left, right of your screen. You see him there. He's set up right now, and all of a sudden, there, oh, it looks like a defender blocker may have even fallen on the back of his legs. Cantrell makes the catch as he driven the defend the cornerbacks back far enough to get the first down. Take a look at Eric Arthur, the junior out of Milford, Mass. And with Eric down on the field, we'll take a break. Since 1955, Sullivan Tire has been driven by one commitment, to give our customers the highest quality tires in car care available, period. Have we succeeded? I think so. Are we finished? Not by a long shot. Why? Because we're Sullivan Tire, and we want it that way. Now save 15 to 30% on Goodyear's 60,000 mile Invicta GS at all Sullivan Tire and Jordan Marsh car care centers. Sail in Saturday. Breeders' Cup is great. The most exciting thing in horse racing. Breeders' Cup is racing's biggest day. Oh, I love it. It's wonderful. This is what racing's all about. We'll take you close up and give you the best seat in the house to see the championship races and witness the championship moments. Breeders' Cup. You don't want to miss it. The best going against each other in the biggest horse racing event of the year. Watch it live Saturday, October 31st on NBC Sports. The Breeders' Cup, Thoroughbred Racing's biggest championship event, will be run on Saturday, October 31st, and you can be part of it. 
get in on all the championship racing action and pick seven wagering live via satellite at the Breeders' Cup simulcast outlet near you. Play the entire Breeders' Cup and National Pick 7 at Rockingham with big screen action, common pool wagering with Suffolk and more. Gates open at 9 a.m., post time 10.30 a.m. Okay, we're back as you take a look at Eric Arthur, and it does not look good. He looks obviously in pain holding his knee, and that's what happened. He got chopped. We're back to action. Laundry throws it over the middle and really into a crowd looking for Carlo, but uh, there were five white shirts there led by Scott Hughes. Aviation science major, and maybe that's why he kind of does well in the pass coverage back there. But uh, that makes it fourth down. Plymouth in very quickly, and they're going to punt it. And uh, Cole is going to hit it from a, probably about his 50, and gets off a good boot end over end, and it's coming down to Brady, who tries to get around and is immediately taken down on the play by Colby Compton, who. Uh, was just down there in a hurry out of uh, Colby is out of uh, Massachusetts. Gets a little revenge there. East Brookfield, Massachusetts. Khalil sets up and I think he has, pardon me, uh, he sets up and I think he has an idea about where he wants to go. But as soon as he does, Mr. Compton is there to deliver the big hit. Phil Brady's first punt return of the day is not what you'd call a roaring success. Yeah, close to a face mask there as he goes down on about the, uh, let's call it the four yard line. And this is uh, scary territory for a team that runs the option. Gwinden, it's gonna come left. And immediately, stuff fumble. I think the whistle was on the play, but uh, I think he fumbled to avoid, <laughs> fumbled to avoid going to the end zone for safety because that definitely great penetration. The five-man line obviously doing the job for Plymouth as they just stuffed Nguyen. Watch it again here. He gives it to Nguyen. As you said, Dave, he's just about to, to think about making a move before he can. Toby Cloutier is right on top of him. Squeeze the ball up again after the whistle. So loss of at least two on the play. It looks like a second down from the one-yard line. I would think Bridgewater could be the last play of the first quarter. Just going to want to keep it in, give it to the fullback, and just see carve out some room. And that is a mistake, I think, by somebody. It's either a state by Rich McKinnon who uh, I think he's thought the center moved the ball, but I don't think that's going to be the play. The green shirt's marking it back, and that gets Bridgewater out of a big hole. And this has been a, tr a thing that's occurred a, a number of times, John, for Plymouth. They continue to make the penalty at absolutely the wrong time. It's some something we saw happen in the game we telecast against Lowell earlier in the season. It really was a reason they were so far behind and had to go to the miracle comeback to salvage a tie game against Lowell. Also happened last week in their disappointing loss to Maine Maritime, 25-12. Just, you know, big big gainers would be called back by penalties. Second down and seven now, and that was another whistle, and it looks like they might have taken too much time, <laughs> or the third quarter, the first quarter, that is, uh, has ended with no time left on the clock. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Those lines are from the poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost in which he talks about his choice to take another, less traveled road. Frost wrote and taught at Plymouth State College in Plymouth, New Hampshire, for one stretch of his long and illustrious life. Plymouth State College knows about those moments of choice when you see the roads to your future diverging before you. I remember hearing about Plymouth my junior year in high school. I didn't want to go to a big university, but I was afraid of missing out on, on things. Coming to Plymouth was the best decision I could have made. There are a lot of different roads you can take, and many ways to take them. It's up to you to find the one that's best for you. At Plymouth, the road can be fast and exciting. And welcome back to Courier Memorial Field here in Plymouth, New Hampshire, as we get set to start the second quarter of a scoreless tie between Plymouth State College and Bridgewater State 
College. And uh, I think Plymouth has got to be pretty happy with the way things have gone defensively, John. They do, Dave. I think uh, we made the mistake of talking about a high-scoring game when the game was about to begin in our opening. Naturally, we've gone through a scoreless first period thus far, although there has been plenty of offensive activity. Of course, remember, we said that against Lowell last time <laughs> we were here, and the second half turned out to be a firefight. Quinden back for his second pass. He's going deep, and it's to uh, Piccioli. Intercepted by DeVito, and he looked like the intended receiver the way he went after that ball, and he goes down immediately at the 42-yard line. We may be seeing why Bridgewater stays away from the pass as much as they can. Uh, so far, Gwyndon's thrown two passes, and they've been completed to Plymouth defenders. Take another look at this again. In the shadow of his own goalpost, he wants to buy some real estate and get out of there. He sets back, has plenty of time to throw. He kind of floats it, though. Gets the front end of the ball up in the air, and it hangs. DeVito is able to outrun the intended receiver and make that over-the-shoulder catch a la Willie Mays. Now we have Plymouth heading in the opposite direction. Of course, it also on first down, it also serves a purpose. Almost as good as a punt as uh, Plymouth will set up shop at the 42-yard line. Immediately, Rochelle his first run of the ball game. And it uh, looked like he was going to go for some, and then hit a wall at the 40 and went right down for a two-yard gain. That wall is a linebacker named Eric Leet who straightened him right up and knocked him back. Managed to pick up maybe a couple of yards. Looks like second and eight. Plymouth carrying the ball a little bit more now. Don't think they've forgotten. Eric Leet right there, a senior out of Everton, Massachusetts, with the tackle. Plymouth with a second down. Second and eight to go. Now they've got two guys in the backfield. Boss the tailback, and they're going to go back to the pass. Oh, and a blitz from the blind side. Absolutely no chance. Rick Cignone on the play. Looked like there's a fumble on top of it, and I don't know how he couldn't have fumbled it. And uh, I'll tell you what, as a quarterback, those babies hurt when you catch him right in the numbers from behind. Laundry, the left-hander, rolls a little bit and sets up. Naturally, it's his blind side. He's rolling to his left, and while he's looking for a receiver, he's thinking everything is fine. Obviously, he's not correct. He gets the big hit right there by Rick Pignon. The ball squirts loose. He had not started the arm forward. Tom Black pounces on it. Bridgewater with a big first down at the Plymouth 47. And they're going to come right back at it, and uh, turnovers continue to be a hallmark of this game. Tacomo fumble, and that one's into the pile, and I have no idea who got that. Plymouth has got it. And Giard, I don't know how the heck he got it. Where the heck did he come from? But let's take a look and see if we can pick it out so we can do our job. Goes to Como right on the left-hand side. And they're just having, and this is the simple basic part. And it looked like he didn't want to give it up. And it just goes right in the pile. And it just bounces right out to Giard as he falls on it immediately. But uh, Mike Giard now has an interception and a fumble recovery. Going to pick up a couple of stars here for the ball game. Mike Giard out of Tollgate High School. And uh, this, we're at the 45-yard line now as we go play ping pong between Bridgewater and Plymouth. Laundry back to pass, and he's going to go down. Again, the blitz. Gary King coming in from the right-hand side as the linebacker. And uh, Plymouth may have to rethink that philosophy of sending everybody out of the backfield. He comes in on the right-hand side. Not much offense going on here on either side of the ball. Laundry's looking for something downfield, and while he's waiting, King changes his plans for him. The last four or five offensive plays have been defensively dominated. And it's going to be an eight-yard loss. Gary King from Canton, Massachusetts. Sonny, Sonny Jergensen must have been his favorite player. <laughs> now, he's probably too young for Sonny Jergensen. Laundry second and about 19 yard lines for the Panthers to Wachelns. And uh, not a lot of running room. Nice little dump off pass. Hopefully they were trying to shake loose, but Scott Hughes was right there to make the play. And it brings him down to the right hand side. Plymouth picks up about uh, five yard line. Five yards. Nice tackle. Nice tackle in the open field as well. Uh, Hughes is not a big guy, 5'8, 180. And Wachelns has been known to drag a couple of defenders around on occasion. Nice play by Hughes to bring him down. I'm sorry, John. Wachelns a good receiver. He's got 14 catches coming into the game. Does a nice job sliding out into the slot. Okay, Plymouth third and 12. 12.55 left in the second period. Here's a surprise. Laundry back to pass. He lofts it toward. Cantrell, but Cantrell couldn't get there. Laundrie had to throw it off his back foot as uh, the defenders, he had to get rid of it quickly. Looks like Hughes had the best shot at that ball. Uh, Bridgewater stayed still in that <coughs> main coverage, trying to stay with the Plymouth receivers. They seem to have abandoned that under game that was working so well for them. Perhaps uh, they've seen something that allowed them to try and take it deeper downfield. I'll tell you, I think that's where they play best, too, in their games where they really have come back in those periods. They've done that the best. Okay, Ryan Cole gets it off. Brady is back there. He got in the 20. Fakes the reverse, and he's got some running room, but 
A lot of guys are there. Colby Compton, one of the guys on top of the pile once again. And uh, Chris Rapp, another one. And uh, Compton's been in on, done a good job on both uh, on both punt situations for Plymouth. Compton's a freshman from East Brookfield, Mass. Freshman linebacker who's showing his stuff on special teams, probably looking for a little bit of playing time with the rest of the, the green wall defensive unit. Bridgewater with the first down now on the, their own 25-yard line. I would well, think Bridgewater would want to make a statement here. They really got to get it going. They're going to switch quarterbacks, see if they can get it going, though. And uh, it's an interesting move. Jeff Putnam in the game, number 17. He's a transfer from University of Rhode Island. And right off the first play, Khalil takes it up amid a, a, a rain of uh, penalty flags up over the 30-yard line, two of them on the play. But uh, Jeff Putnam... As I mentioned, a transfer, John, from University of Rhode Island. He's uh, really got a good arm, but uh, I'm surprised a little bit. He's got 34 carries. The thing about Bridgewater is they've got all kinds of guys with carries. They've got like five or six guys over th with more than 30 carries, so they just keep running bodies at you. If you remember, Bridgewater's last offensive play, however, was the fumble where there seemed to be a mix-up between Gwyndon and Como. Perhaps the uh, coaching staff saw something they weren't pleased with. Gwyndon is on the sidelines without his helmet. Uh, he's not in any pain. Obviously, it's no injury. When you go to Putnam, uh, you go to a little bit more of an effective passer. Gwyndon was hitting about 41%. He's good for almost 50%. Uh, he has thrown a couple of interceptions, but you're right, David. I think they might view him as the man to get the offense on track. Okay, so first and five off the penalty on Plymouth. Once again, the Como. He's up over the 35-yard line. Tough, tough yardage. Roper in on the tackle. Coming up from the bottom of the pile. Giard is down there as well. Number may, one. May have enough for the first down. Yes, they are indicating the first down. Good work by Como in traffic. Ironically, that's what Plymouth would like Bridgewater State to do this afternoon. They're trying to shut off the outside game that's been so effective for the Bears. They want them to take it inside and play to Plymouth's strength, which is the bigger guys up in the middle, including John Morley yet Como's able to plow through for five yards on the first down. Chris Langloss in the ball game. Now he's in motion coming, going to reset. Big guy. Two people in the backfield, Como and Khalil. And there's the pitch to Como with some warning room on the right-hand side. And that's the first time Bridgewater really has gotten a chance to open it up. Takes it up over to about the 47-yard line. It was DeVito who made the tackle coming up from the left-hand side. Let's look at this again now with Putnam running the offense. I think you'll see he holds the ball just a little bit longer here before he makes the pitch. He pays for it, of course, when he's dumped very unceremoniously in the backfield. But after that, it's all Como. Nice move upfield. Took a light, as you said, they took a great tackle to stop him. He had plenty of room to take it upfield. Matt Caraciola also finished off the play, and uh, DeVito tripped him up. Okay, Langloss once again going over on the right hand. Starts out in the left, goes to the right, motion, resets. Here comes the pitch to Khalil, and he slips down, and he had some room. And uh, John Morland, Toby Cloutier, check that, covers him up at about the 47-yard line. No gain, so it's going to be second and 10. Scoreless tie here at Courier Memorial Field, 10-52. Still remaining here in the second quarter. Somehow I'm able to sense a, a real lift in spirit for the Bears, and perhaps it's because Putnam has been put in there, but they seem to be playing with a little more enthusiasm. Uh, he's very assertive in making that pitch. He takes the hit, doesn't worry about getting rid of the ball too soon, and I think perhaps Gwynnon was just a little bit too tentative for the Bridgewater coaching staff. It also looks like, I think it seems to me like he might be under orders to uh, get the ball to the outside, which may open up, because they were going almost exclusively inside. It's back to pass. Out in the flat to Khalil, who almost got away from Cloutier, but Cloutier hung in there with a long grab on the jersey. Khalil goes down on about the 47-yard line. Penalty flag after a little altercation on the sideline. Looks to me like it might be Khalil. Yeah, Khalil seems to be protesting to the officials, as you see, but take another look at the play, see if we can pick it up. Once again, it's Putnam rolling to his right, as you said, trying to open things up, Dave. And he hits Khalil easily. He, he makes the catch. Cloutier with a nice tackle, hangs onto the shirt, does a little bit of wardrobe adjustment with help from Giard. Goes out of bounds on the Plymouth sideline. Perhaps he thought there was a late hit there. And that was close. Adam it, it, Hawks. Yeah, more, more and more as I look at that, as Giard and Cloutier brought him down. It looks like Hawks may have been a late arrival on the play. Or Healy. It might have been 56. Okay, let's not cast too many aspersions here. We're on the wrong side of the field. Allegedly, that anyway. we can say that and cover ourselves like they do in newspapers. They're marking it off against Bridgewater, so it was Khalil's reaction that drew the flag, and that will put the Bears in a hole. And that hurts. Again, uh, they had been moving the ball, doing a nice job. Actually, it would have been third down. It's 
going to remain. That should be a third down situation. It is going to be a third down situation. Third and 25, because it happened after the play was down. But uh, Putnam is going to look it over the center. They've got a wide out to the right. And now they've got uh, Jesse Hammond in motion coming also to the left. Dropping straight back, looking for Hammond. That's the ball go. Nice arm on the part of Putnam to let it go. Pass went to Hammond over the 40-yard line. Would have been a first down, but uh, a little bit overthrown. Strong arm by Jeff Putnam. Again, you mentioned he had transferred from the University of Rhode Island. Uh, football program that's known for its passing offense, and I guess Putnam showed why he was there. One more look at this again as Putnam shows a little bit of the arm that brought him to Bridgewater State. Rolling to his left sets up field, and he does have the receiver open. Just a little bit too much arm here as we follow the flight of the ball. It's taking a while to come down. Just outside the diving reach, leaving a fourth down and 25, forcing Bridgewater to the punt. Scott Kennedy in the punt. G-yard is deep. It's going to come up short, and uh, Plymouth would be wise to let that one go. G-yard doesn't do it. Goes right through his legs, and it's got to be Bridgewater's ball, and a, a very big mental mistake by Mike G-yard, who generally doesn't make those kind of mistakes, John. Ball kicked end over end, as you saw at the last second as it approaches GR instead of getting out of the way he foolishly reaches down for it squirts right through there right through the five hole as Derek Sanderson would say seven Bridgewater defenders with momentum coming in easily able to fall on the ball and make the recovery putting Putnam and company in business well, the big thing is where was he going to go with three white shirts right there there's no possible place he could have gone and uh, I'll tell you what I wouldn't want to be in his shoes in the film session on Monday morning Monday afternoon, you should check that. They gotta go to class on Monday morning. Putnam trying to hand off to Como. And Jeff Jarry makes the stop immediately coming in from the right-hand side, the right linebacker. And uh, that inside play, you can tell Plymouth worked on that a lot and wanted to shut that down because uh, uh, Bridgewater has not gotten anything uh, to speak of out of that particular play. Getting real good defensive play today from Cloutier and Jarry in the middle. Again, Morley's doing a lot, just forcing them away from that big middle. He's just the big guy they're trying to run away from, leaving Jerry, Cloutier, and Giard in position to make the tackles. Como and Khalil in the backfield. One wide out to the right-hand side. We're going to look for the pass. Same play. They're going outside to Brady, who's wide open and stumbles into the end zone after the catch. Beautiful pass on the part of Putnam, capitalizing on the big mistake on the part of the Panther hunting unit. Giard and P.J. Hansen in coverage. Let's take another look again. Putnam rolling to his left. Looks downfield. Plenty of time. Not threatened at all. And just lays it right in there. Right into the outstretched arms. Beautiful Tim work by there, incidentally. For the first score of the game, Bridgewater stayed on top. Six zip as they prepare for the conversion. And the 37, Matt Carroll in to try the extra point. And, uh, he's gotten a share of uh, extra point attempts. Has yet to get on the board with it with uh, a field goal, 0 for 3, but he picks up the PAT, and Bridgewater stretches it out to 7-0 with 8.54 left in the second period. And we'll be back. Ah, Sundays and pro football. But why not cheer for your team all week long with a pro football fan pack? Pro football fan pack? Yep, you get an official NFL cap, mug, key ring, even a notepad and pen, all with your team's logo. Whoa, how do I get all this? Just choose your favorite team, call this toll-free number, and ask for the Pro Football Fan Pack. Your fan pack comes with an NFL-licensed team cap, team mug, team key ring, and a team notepad and pen you can use every day of the week. Whoa, how much is all this going to cost? Well, if you bought all of this separately, you could spend $35 or more. But our fan pack is only $19.95. $19.95 for all this? Yep. This is great. Order your Pro Football Fan Pack now. Get your favorite team's cap, mug, key ring, notepad, and pen. Use your credit card and call 1-800-972-3100. Or send check or money order for $19.95 plus $485 shipping and handling to the address on your screen. But for faster service, call 1-800-972-3100. Sorry, no CODs. We are back with the score 7 for Bridgewater. Nothing for Plymouth State College as Bridgewater gets ready to... Uh, kick off to Plymouth going right from our right to left and uh, Matt Carroll is the guy who's going to kick it off 
Plymouth, uh, here's a shot of the ambulance. And unfortunately, it appears that, that they are going to take Eric Arthur, who was hurt a little earlier in the game, sack master for Bridgewater, the defender. And uh, looks like it's his ankle, John, as it's iced. He was caught in that uh, chop block that took him out. And there goes the kickoff, and it's going to go out of bounds on the 26-yard line. And Plymouth uh, will have the option of uh, taking it there or having to kick again. But that baby looked like a, a dying quail <laughs> as it was kicked. I don't know if it was sent over in that direction on purpose. I hope that wasn't a political statement on your part. Um, <laughs> No. Again, uh, Eric Arthur is down here below us on the Bridgewater bench preparing to be escorted from the field while they negotiate the conditions of the penalty here. Plymouth with the option of taking the ball at the point where it went out of bounds or having the kick. They're having a long discussion over it. And it perhaps, appears we're going to go with the uh, kick. They're going to, no, the offense is going to come on the field. They're going to take it at the 26. Well, perhaps after the last effort to field the kick, by the Panthers, they decided they were better off to take the ball where it is. Actually, it's the 34-yard line. They're going to do that. But uh, Panthers uh, continue in their uh, in the situation. They've continued to get themselves, and they trail first half scoring 87 to 25. You get a look at the pain of uh, Eric Arthur. But Plymouth has trailed miserably, or in uh, throughout, they've just gotten themselves, dug themselves in the continual holes, and it started again today. And there it goes inside to Cantrell. Can't had to reach back, couldn't hold on to it. And uh, post the white guys, Costco was one of the guys in there on the defensive play, and uh, as was uh, Gary Cambra. Costco talking to himself, knowing he had an interception in his hands, took all the steam off the ball. Laundry had some mustard on that one, but wasn't able to pull it in. And Plymouth looking more, perhaps, now that they trail, they might go more back to that game in the flat, take advantage of Cantrell's pass-receiving ability. With Jones in motion, he started in the slot. Coming to the short side of the field. There's, this is Boston, the pitch. Nowhere to go. Tried to turn it up, but he couldn't do it. They just, they just shut it down. Jason Vega, one of the people on the play. Tom Black, another one. And also the linebackers, uh, number 90, David Daniel Grimes, who's also one of the players. Nice pursuit by the Bridgewater defense to uh, sniff that out and then snuff it out. Third and about 13 for the Panthers. Probably look for Laundry again to put the ball in the air. And uh, we'll watch the pass rush. This is the play, uh, the situation where Bridgewater's done a lot of blitzing so far. And here he comes. Daniel Grimes is chasing. Laundry, ball goes in and out. Nice play on the sideline. I believe it's number 16. Yes, it was. Gary Cambra did a nice job. Laundry did a nice job of getting rid of the ball because if he held it another count, he would be wearing a size 46 large on his back <laughs> in number 90, Daniel Grimes. And he has found out the hard way how that can hurt today. One fumble forced earlier when he was hit from behind by Tom Black. This has uh, been a mistake play game. Plymouth with a couple of fumbles. Bridgewater with a couple of fumbles and two interceptions as Ryan Coles gets it off. Picciello with the ball. He gets it and immediately goes down by, let's take a guess, number 97, Colby Compton, three for three on the play. Makes the tackle. Just a nice job. He just does a good job. We're going to have to isolate on him next time. See where he's come from. Somebody's got to put a body on him. Watch one, more, watch one more time. We're turning into the Colby Compton highlight film. Uh, nice punt by Cole. Forces Piccioli back, but before he can even look for the wall to be set up, Compton outstrips his blockers, takes him down. And that is a nice open field tackle. Those are tough to make, especially in a slick field. Okay, Putnam stays in the game, keeps the ball, and uh, Jerry goes in there, but uh, had a little bit of running room. Jerry, the only player there, he made a nice tackle. But uh, Putnam continues to... To me, breathes life into it as he takes, opens things up. I guess his presence is the big thing. He can throw the football, and uh, he's, he's looking to take the ball to the outside, which creates opportunities. The ability to throw is a big difference there. As you said, when Gwynden was in the game, two of his three passes were picked off by Plymouth, and they, they weren't even close in all candor. Uh, Putnam gives him a different look here, much more of a, a versatile threat. Plymouth has to respect that. First, uh, second and 10. Plymouth, everything bunched up. Everybody inside the 40-yard line. And here we go to Nguyen. And uh, he doesn't have a lot of, lot of room. Inside the tackles, it's been tough going for the guys in the white shirts. And uh, who's in on the play? Carrier Ciola is one of the guys. And uh, let's see, who else was there? Number 66. 
on the Plymouth defense off the bench. Here we Keith Ferreira. Barry Nguyen, as you see, from Kenner Bunkport, Maine, of course, the sophomore who's been doing a lot of the heavy work on the ground for Bridgewater State so far this season. Third and ten for uh, Bridgewater. Looks like they're going to go out in the pass. Nguyen in motion, and here we go. Back to pass. They're looking for Earl Johnson. No, Pisciolo, who's got some room, and he's got it, and he is going to take it down for a touchdown. Hot dogs it on the way into the end zone. Continues to hot dog it in the end zone, but a beautiful pass by Putnam. And once again, as the defense has pinched inside, everybody inside about six yards, they're getting burned deep. We talked about Putnam providing that extra wrinkle to the Bridgewater offense. He sets up on his 25, lets it go 45 yards in the air. What a pass on the money. Not much DeVito could do. He made the great effort to try and get it, but Piccioli had a nice lead on the pass, just took it over the shoulder. A little bit of a... And those are the kind that get forearms. Those are the kind of plays that get forearms in your Adam's apple on the next time down the field. <laughs> Matt Carroll but, in uh, again to try the extra point. He's one for one thus far today. Pizzioli has, uh, as uh, Carroll puts it through and puts it out to 14 to nothing with 6:30 left in the second period. We're going to come back here with more action right after this. Bridgewater State College, founded in 1840, is home to approximately 5,300 full-time undergraduate and 1,500 graduate students who are taking advantage of the vast liberal arts program BSC offers. Situated on a 170-acre campus in southeastern Massachusetts, Bridgewater State offers its students a quality education made possible by an excellent faculty, advanced facilities, outstanding resources for learning, and a sincere concern for the well-being of each individual student. Bridgewater also offers a variety of student life activities rich in depth and scope. There are more than 70 student clubs and organizations on campus, in addition to an extensive intercollegiate athletic and intramural program. Bridgewater State College, from its beginning, has been dedicated to a tradition of excellence in public service, with its goal being to provide access to higher education to all qualified students. And that dedication will continue into the 90s, as it has for the past 150 years. What I think is most exciting about Bridgewater State College is the spirit of the faculty, the students, the staff, and the alumni. This is a college community that reaches out for every opportunity to learn and grow. With the spirit we have, and with the addition of our new $10 million technology center, I am enormously optimistic about Bridgewater's future. Bridgewater State College, an institution of higher learning for one and all. We're back. Panthers uh, trailing the Bears at Bridgewater State College, 14 to nothing, uh, on the heels of a big lift, big spark for uh, Bridgewater. They come out passing the football by Jeff Putton when he came in to quarterback here in the second half, uh, second quarter that is, replacing Bob Winden. Putnam, Putnam with touchdown passes so far to Brady and Piccioli in less than a quarter. And there it goes to uh, the short man. Number 49 has got the ball, and he takes it up. Chris Allen did a nice job of running. That's a, you know, a fullback. Also plays a little, he played a little linebacker earlier, but I guess not. But he did a nice job. Took it up over the 40 to the 42-yard line. And uh, Plymouth has some very good field position. I think it's time, John, with about a little over six minutes left in the second period for them to... Uh, they really have to make a statement here and get some points on the board. First play of the game, they went deep to Cantrell and they had good success. He made the nice catch. You're right there. They do have to open up and start pressing the ball downfield. But Bridgewater jams it in. The ball's in the 42. They've got every defender inside the 48-yard line. Here's the draw to Friedman. And the defense reacts right to the ball. Nice job on the part of on the part of uh, Gary King was there. Eric Leap was there, and they really. No deception on the part, or at least they weren't fooled by the play, and uh, I like the call. Eric Lee, the senior from Everett, Massachusetts, in on the tackle there. Friedman really didn't have much room. He needs a little bit of space to operate to get that slashing running style on track. Didn't find it on the Bridgewater defense that time. Once again, Bridgewater continues to pack it in tight. Defensive backfield, Bernier, Scott Hughes, and Gary Camber just continue to stand there. Laundry back to pass. Nowhere to go. A penalty flag as he scrambles up across the 40-yard line, avoid maybe a one-yard loss. Athletic ability saved that because he looked like he was dead meat. Gary King was right there 
on the blitz, but uh, I thought the, def the offensive line for Plymouth did a pretty good job. Just the defensive backfield for Bridgewater just shut down the receivers. They did a nice job. We mentioned earlier in the broadcast that one thing Plymouth was going to do to try and thwart the Bridgewater stunting and blitzing was to go to a quick drop and try and take the short stuff. Now that they've changed the thought process and they're going a little bit longer downfield, it puts a lot more pressure on Laundry and the offensive line. They have to pick up the blitz and buy him time. He was lucky enough to get out of the pocket. As you said, they have avoid a big loss but things broke down long before he could find a receiver downfield. Now, the other thing is we may have a clue as to why uh, the offensive line did such a good job there. I think the penalty was declined third <laughs> and 11, but uh, someone on the left-hand side of that offensive line was accused of holding his opponent. There were shells in motion. Plymouth with a third and 11. Laundry short drop, and he has brought down once again Gary King continues taking over for Eric Arthur who has gone out of the ball game with an injury but he is in the blitz on the right hand side and they Plymouth loses again watch one time again laundry looking for the short drop gets back into the pocket and looks down for his one receiver you have to give him credit he is checking off when he sees a man is covered we should tribute the Bridgewater State defense they're in man-to-man -man coverage in the secondary and they're doing a very nice job and he overpowered Friedman on his blitz on the right hand side just bowled over and it's Brady who makes the fair catch at about the 24-yard line, have another penalty flag on the play. It's not going to do much for Plymouth, even if, unless it's a 15-yarder. And uh, it's a penalty. Looks like the guy's pointing at the green side of the ball, so it looks like it's a Plymouth penalty anyway. And now uh, Bridgewater has a, has a choice. That was a good kick by Ryan Cole. Uh, so probably they get, they've got a choice, so they want to take it again and see if they can get some kind of a return. 10, 20, 30, 40, 41 yard punt on the part of Ryan Cole. And that is what they're going to do. They're going to bring Plymouth back out on the field to punt it again. Pizzioli and uh, Brady will be the back men. Or at least it looks that way. The ball hasn't moved. Now here it comes. What do you think Plymouth's got to do, John, to get, this, get things jump started? A little under five minutes here in the second period. They're trailing by 14 points. It's not an unaccustomed position for them. <laughs> no. As we mentioned earlier, they are trail 87-25. They've been outscored in the first half ball games this year. Take it in there, Quinn! Okay, ball is, uh, we've got second, I mean, fourth down in about 20 yards to go. And ball's going to be hit from about the 25-yard line. And now, there's a whistle on the play, and Bridgewater takes a timeout. So with the score, 14 to nothing, a little under five minutes to go in the second period, Bridgewater leads it. We're going to take a break. Stay with us. What would you do if you were rich? I'd quit my day job and become a full-time chicken. Watch. I donate a llama to the White House lawn. Well, I'd really like to play left field for the Sox at Fenway Park. I'd probably return Donald Trump's call. He wants me to buy his yacht. If I had a lot of money, I'd buy a 1952 Nash Rambler to go under this petty girl hood ornament. Uh, I'd come out of hiding. Welcome back. Plymouth getting ready for their second try to punt here in the second period. Ryan Cole's going to hit big rush on. Cole gets rid of it, but the Brady who takes a fair catch <laughs> at about the 37. That was a late fair catch. <laughs> But uh, they picked up about uh, 12 or 13 yards in the exchange. Toby Cloutier looked like a drag racer when he blew by him. I thought I'd have to put the shootout to stop his <laughs> momentum. Uh, instead, Brady, with a wise move to make the fair catch, I think he saw that freight train named I mean, uh, Colby even, Compton coming at him. He didn't me. even have a chance to get his hand up over his shoulder. It was one of those quick things. I thought he was waving at somebody going by. Colby Compton continuing his outstanding play for the Plymouth Special Teams forces the fair catch, but now Bridgewater behind Jeff Putnam with a first down at their own 38. 4.50 left in the first half. Pizzioli in motion to the right. And we're coming left to Khalil with some room. And Roper in there on the stop. Late hit. Somebody jumped into the pile. Number 14, Tyler Moore, jumped into the pile at the end. There's a yellow flag down there. And I got it. Oh, it's a hold on Bridgewater. And uh, I think Tyler Moore got away with one because he really kind of jumped in there to the pile at the end. Nice play by Roper to shut things down. The big guy, number 99. Uh, looks like Khalil had a real lot of room to run, but he uh, picked up about three on the play, all for naught, as Bridgewater is going to get called for a, uh, a holding penalty. Taking it back all the way to the 31-yard line for the Bears. 
negates a small pickup by Khalil, but I don't think he'll mind. Remember, he had that gaudy seven-yard average coming into the game. That would have hurt the average. Makes it tough to maintain those things. You need one big run. Nguyen in the backfield. Hasn't been there as much as usual. Putnam back to pass. Here comes the screen with a lot of room. Khalil is the only guy there. And he has got some room, and he's going to take it up over about the 46-yard line, and he avoided GR who dove at his heels. DeVito was another one. Now, DeVito was in on the tackle, but uh, they set that up well. First time we've seen that play, John. Set up very nicely by Putnam. They set, they slide it off over to the right. He waits, floats it over the top, and with two big blockers out in front of him, Khalil knows what to do, just turns it on. Nice dodge of the GR attack when it took Morley and DeVito double-teaming him to pull him down. Second and about three, and that's the kind of play that looks like a much bigger gain than it really is. And they really had the Panthers uh, fooled on that one. Caraciolo, the only guy on the entire left side who was there to uh, try and take out at least some of the blocking. Hey, Putnam keeps it. He's got some room. Penalty flag once again as he takes it up over the 50 into Panther territory with a nice little spin move <laughs> de deceiving the Panther defense. Great reaction play by Jeff Putnam. Let's watch this again. As he prepares to run the Veer offense and make the pitch, I think he saw number 23, Matt Carasiola coming through, so he wisely made that reverse pivot, as you said, turned it upfield and made something out of what could have been a potentially disastrous play had he made the pitch. It would have been the Carasiolo on the dead run going in the wrong direction, but the gain is negated. Jeff Putnam's work, his improvisation is neutralized by the penalty. And Carasiola, he, he, his key wasn't the quarterback, <laughs> that's for sure. He was going after Como coming out of the backfield, and he just drilled him. But uh, but uh, Putnam had the presence of mind to hold on to that football. Second and about 12 now. Nguyen and Khalil in the ball game in the backfield. Here goes Jesse Hammond to the right in motion. Second and 13, back to pass. On the roll right, and he's going downfield to Hammond and just misses him. And once again, the white shirts were had no one between them and the goal line. And there's some major breakdowns happening in the defensive backfield for the Panthers, which is their real strength, John. I think that was a nice move by Hammond to turn it upfield as well. I think it was, originally it was a much shorter route, but when he saw Putnam roll free, the offensive line did a great job of picking up the blitz. Carasiola was neutralized at the line. Putnam, with all kinds of time, waved him down, just threw it a little bit beyond his reach, but nice improvisation once again by both Putnam and Hammond. And I think... Uh, I think the presence of uh, the concern that they had to shut everything down and avoid that run. They've been caught by surprise. The keys are just, the, line, the defensive backs are just coming up much too soon. Here we go, putting them back to pass. The rush is on. Tyler Moore is in there on the play, blitzing from the right-hand side. Adams Hawks, the nose guard, was there too. And that's the first time the Panthers really have had any kind of real penetration on the play as we take a look at it on the replay. Right from the middle, there's Hawks. Disappears for a bit. Putnam tried to roll left before he could get anywhere. Number 85 forced it back inside where he ran into Moore. And big hit forcing the punt now. Bridgewater had the second and four. Now they've got a fourth and about 17 or 18. Yeah, that was Wes Oswald. He's traded his jersey. Here's the punt. Nice punt to Giard who's going to take it at the 35 and cut, takes it up over the 40. But uh, let's see who was there on the play. Number 22, Pignoni was there, as was Brian McCarthy, I believe. Usually you don't see uh, offensive linemen down there, but Mr. McCarthy got himself down. A guard, pretty good work for a guard. I say, no easy feat for a guy who goes 6'1", 235. He had some momentum, made the tackle on Giard, which would leave Plymouth with a first down from their own 40. 222 remaining here in the second quarter, Dave. Plymouth really has to do something to get on track, and I wonder if they might go back to that short passing game in the flat that seems so successful the first couple of drives. They just seem to get impatient. When it doesn't work a couple of times, they don't want to take time to go down the field rather than, so they try and go for the big one. And I think that's what really stalls them. But uh, Brian McCarthy, by the way, is... Uh, he is the guy that a lot of Bridgewater players are going to get close to because he's a student representative in the Hall of Fame committee. So everybody wants to be nice to him, so they've got a <laughs> shot at it when the time comes. Okay, Fountain in motion. No one in the backfield for Plymouth. And Laundry goes right back to the passing game over the middle of the Wachelns and uh, really threw it into a crowd. Camber was there chasing it down, but uh, 
continue to see some problems on the part of the Plymouth passing game, and uh, Scott Hughes also was in on the play. Well, they had Carlo out here on the on the near side trying to get some some of the traffic away from the middle because when you're going to send with Shelns into the middle, he's only 5'10". He's not a big guy, and at 220, I doubt he has much of a vertical leap in that crowd. Yeah, and it's really a deception play to get him as uh, we see some more laundry out in the field. I don't mean Paul. He's, <laughs> he's in there in the middle of the play, but uh, I think we've got a... Uh, We've got an illegal Some kind procedure. of a procedure penalty. Everybody but Plymouth. the chain gang was moving on that one. That's right. Plymouth is going to be walking it back, so they're going to be faced with a second and 15, and the problems continue for the guys in green. 217 remaining. Come on, now, G, let's In the go. second period, Plymouth trailing 14 zip, trying to get on track, second on, and 15. Everybody is spill it out to the right hand side, except for. Uh, the governor candidates from New Hampshire here. Laundry goes now to the left. He goes behind to uh, Mark Burke, 5'7". Kind of goes underneath, brings new meaning to underneath the coverage on that pass. But he uh, thrown behind them, and uh, it's going to be third and 15, and the troubles continue to mount. This is a situation, John, where the guys are going to tee off and really come after Laundry. And Laundry in the wish lane, pardon me, back in the shotgun. No, no blocking help back there. This time they'll go back to a traditional set with the single setback. Burke, Carlo, and Cantrell, the wideouts in the slot is with Shelns. And Fountain, also a wideout, started as the tailback. He's coming long right. And the rush is on. And Laundry is brought down, brings it out past the line of scrimmage to about the 34-yard line. But uh, that was, uh, you know, guys on the defensive line and the linebackers, eyes light up in situations like that when... Uh, third and long. Steve McCarthy, the linebacker, was in on the tackle. And with 154 remaining, Ryan Cole back to punt yet again. Wonder if Bridgewater might be coming on this one. Not the time. I, my favorite playing football is the fake punt, but not the time for the for the fake punt. Setting up for the return. Coming over left, and everybody in the white church are just going to stay away from it. Not a real good kick as it goes out of bounds to the left, right in front of the Panther bench at about the, where are they going to mark it? Looks like they're going to mark it around the 40-yard uh, lines. Make that the 37-yard line. So got them out of trouble. No return. So net, net turns out to be a pretty decent punt. And now Jeff Putnam with 138 remaining in the second period may get a chance to show off that arm yet again. The Bears have had some success putting the ball in the air so far today, and they do score a lot of points. They've had outstanding success here in the second period in particular. Scored all their 14 points to grab that 14-point lead. Here we're coming on the option. Putnam's got it. He cuts it up and takes it up over the 45-yard line and going to be one yard short of the first down. Keith Ferreira in on the tackle. Good pursuit by the Plymouth defensive line here. Putnam does a nice job again with the reverse pivot. Freezes everybody for a second. Doesn't even really put a lot into the fake. He doesn't have to. He has it strung out far enough. He takes it upfield, and it took the big play by Ferrara and Mark Roper to bring him down. Eight-yard pickup, second and two. Toby Cloutier uh, was in on the play, or uh, almost was there in the tackle. Stumbled and couldn't make the play. Back to Putnam. Here's the pitch to Como with room on the right side. He drags Giard up to about the 44-yard line into Panther territory, and another first down for the Bridgewater Bears. Stops the clock by going out of bounds with 56 seconds left here in the first half. Further aiding the Bridgewater cause right now. And the field is just that much more opened up uh, since Putnam's come in the ball game. The pass is forced those linebacker, I mean the, uh, the defensive backs who are playing up tight. They really haven't adjusted all that well at the moment. That's where the two TDs came from. But it's just widened the field because they've gone outside. They've got the wideouts running down on the sideline and it's taken away Plymouth's ability to shut down, you know, the, the one play that they have done, or the plays that they've done very well inside the tackles. Coming left, this is going to be a pass as he rolls to the light, looking for Pisciola. And he's going to scramble out of, out of the pocket and take it up about a yard short of the first down. We've got a timeout immediately. Heady play by the quarterback, Putnam. Jeff Putnam uh, goes down, and is laying down there, signaling for a, for a timeout. I think he realized early on that it wasn't going to work out the way he'd planned. He was bound for the sidelines, knew he wasn't going to make it, calls a timeout, and we'll take one ourselves with Bridgewater holding a 14-0 lead. You know, every time I tell people about a great deal they can get on a Chevy, they can't resist. They want to hug me. 
But this time, I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> because it's your Chevy dealer's biggest event of the year. The Chevy year-end clearance sale. To make room for the 93s, we're offering generous cashback deals, smart lease programs, and special incentives on all 92 Chevy cars and trucks in stock. Over 10,000 to choose from. Who can resist? Oh, no. I should have known this was going to happen. See your neighborhood Chevy dealer today. Second 11 here at Courier Memorial Field. Bridgewater driving again on the 47-yard line. Putnam back to pass. Turning out of the pocket, and he's looking downfield to Earl Johnson. Throws across his body at about the 40, and the ball goes in and out of the hands of Johnson. And he did a nice job avoiding that heavy rush. Bob Williston forcing him out of the pocket, giving chase. Putnam hit Earl right in the shoulder pads. Ball popped out. Third down and 11 now for Bridgewater. 39 seconds remaining in the first half. listed as a tight end. When was the last time you saw a tight end? Number one. So that, that just, <laughs> this is carry. This is the way football should be played. You know, the NFL has got, everybody's got to have a number. The wideout's got to be in the 80s. And there's no more of these uh, Charlie Connolly 42 at quarterback. And uh, to me, that's where, that's where I came from, is watching football as a kid. So I love it. Third down and 11 to go. 39 seconds to go in the half. Putnam dropping straight back, looking deep to Como. And Giard comes in, and he's, oh, he had one foot in bounds. I was watching it down the sideline. They're going to call it incomplete, though. Nice job by Giard. Ball kind of hung up there and let him come in from the free safety spot. And you had a nice view of it there at home as well. All kinds of time for Putnam. You can't give him this much time. He tries to take it down the sideline thinking that he can hook him in there. The ball hangs too much, and Giard with a nice watch, move to step up. Watch See the left make foot. the catch. Watch the foot. No. Perhaps he was on the line. Well, you know what it was? I think his right foot landed first, and then his left foot came down. In any case, Bridgewater will be forced to punt with 32 seconds remaining. Anyway, GR doing a nice job in the zone at the free safety spot. And there goes the kick from uh, Scott Kennedy. And GR <laughs> this time lets it go, and it does go into the end zone. And, of course, we know that that has led to disaster the last time when Giard went after it, uncharacteristically, but the ball goes into the end zone. That one was really hit by Scott Kennedy. So we have a penalty flag on the play yet again. Boy, we've had an awful lot of that uh, yellow laundry stuff down the field, as you mentioned earlier. So Plymouth has the option. The kick came from about the 47-yard line. It was a line of scrimmage. And uh, Plymouth is going to bring it back 23 seconds ago. I'm not sure if they're not better off taking it on the 20 and just calling it a half, go back in and regroup. Coach Mazzaferro from Bridgewater State had voiced his displeasure on the sidelines. Now will the officials negotiate with the Plymouth captains, and the Bears will be forced to kick it again. Maybe the Panthers sense a return. I mean, if it was a 15-yard penalty, maybe, but a uh, five-yard penalty, I don't know. Try and force a mistake here, you know, something on the snap, perhaps, or maybe, see if you can buy a break. Yeah, that or maybe you just had the return guy stay away from it and, and go after the block, perhaps, because that's where you really need to come up with something, and that's what Everybody they're going to do. up on the line. Ten guys up on the line. Where will it come from? Adams Hawks made the great block in the game against Lowell a couple of weeks ago for the touchdown. And Kennedy takes the one step, and he's got it. Giard has got the ball, and he's going to the left-hand side. He's the only guy in a green shirt out there that does a pretty good job of negotiating through traffic. Looked like a guy going around a rotary in Rome. I think he, I think someone forgot to tell him they were going for the block. <laughs> That's definitely fair catch territory, but Mike Giard, probably trying to atone for the miscue last time, takes the line drive on the run, gets Plymouth out to about the 26-yard line. They're on 26 with 12 seconds remaining. And will we see Paul Laundry air it out and put one up? They certainly use a lot of wide receivers. We could see about 11 wide receivers here in the play. But uh, looks like they're going to go tight formation and uh, just run out the last 12 seconds here in the half. And that's what they do. Laundry steps, goes down in the knee, and they're going to let the time run out. And uh, it's been a half where this is an unfamiliar position for the Panther coaches who the lows lead the way. They have trailed in almost every half this year. And that is the case now. Plymouth State College trails the number two ranked in the ECAC in New England, Bridgewater State Bears, 14 to nothing as the first half comes to an end. And uh, while well, they take a timeout, we'll take a timeout. If you're searching for a cool, refreshing experience, If you're looking for the real thing, 
then you've come to the right place. Coca-Cola Classic. I see you got my message. I see I'm not the only one. Since 1955, Sullivan Tire has been driven by one commitment, to give our customers the highest quality tires in car care available, period. Have we succeeded? I think so. Are we finished? Not by a long shot. Why? Because we're Sullivan Tire, and we want it that way. Now save 15 to 30% on Goodyear's 60,000 mile Invicta GS at all Sullivan Tire and Jordan Marsh car care centers. Sale ends Saturday. You won't miss a bit of the Boston Celtics this season if you tune into Sports Channel's Emily Celtics Weekly. Each week, host Mike Gorman covers the Celtics with the highlights and interviews that get you closer to the action. Willie May reports on the players and finds out about the personalities behind the team. Plus, there's interviews with the people that make a difference to the Boston Celtics. Nobody has more complete coverage of the Boston Celtics than Sports Channel and Emily Celtics Weekly. Tune in on Monday, November 9th at 7.30 for the premiere of Emily Celtics Weekly. No other sport, professional or otherwise, can match the grassroots excitement, intensity, and spirit of high school football. Each week, Sports Channel updates you on all the big games throughout the region as New England High School Football Weekly returns for its fourth exciting year. Join Peter Gay every Thursday at 6 p.m. and Friday at 5.30 as he brings you the scores, the highlights, and the inside stories that make high school football New England's number one sport. Welcome back to halftime at Plymouth, New Hampshire with the score 14 to nothing in favor of the Bridgewater State Bears. And a little earlier this week, we got a chance to go up on campus, cross the river to see what on the mind of some students, some co-eds here at Plymouth State College. And they're uh, thinking about what's going on and what they're looking forward to in the future. Well, my ultimate goal is to um, gain a doctorate degree and teach at a university or college. So I've always had a sense of obligation to give something back to the community. Um, back to society um, and through education. I think I can be there for a lot of kids. I think it's a, really tough out there and um, they need someone to, who cares about them, who, who's willing to put um, their life's efforts towards them to help them um, have a chance to get somewhere in their lives. Uh, I really like to serve the people, I believe. How come? Um, well, if you look at right now, even the year, you know, the election 1992, um, people really want somebody who's interested in helping society and in giving the best leadership you can. And for me, that's been a lifelong dream, something that when I came to college, um, I thought that business was going to be the field I wanted to go into. So I'm getting a business degree, but that degree has led to an interest in politics um, that I really want to get into. I plan on, if I have to, going to Colorado, Minnesota, something like that. I, I hear the jobs are out there. And they're not here, but if they're out there, that's, that's where I have to go. But eventually I'd like to find a job somewhere um, using my management skills, but in maybe the hotel restaurant business. I, I find that interesting, uh, and I think I, I'd like to do that somewhere in Connecticut. And when you're in that spot 20 years from now, when you're the uh, president of Marriott Corporation and have moved the corporate headquarters to Connecticut, right. <laughs> um, how do you think, uh, what do you think the world is going to be like then? What would you like the world to be like? I take things from a, a business perspective because that's, that is my major, I'm a management major, and I, and I take it from that perspective. And I think that as far as our country on a whole, I hope that we can become more united. I, I see a change in attitudes and understandings mainly between men and women and things like that in different races and I hope that in the future that we as the United States of America can, can regra regain some of the uh, market share, if you want to call it that, of, of the, the world. We are an incredible economic power and I think that if we can all become accepting of each other's differences, backgrounds, things like that, we can go a lot farther. Um, especially with accepting women in the workplace as equals, not as a quota, as an equal, as in um, they're there as my friend, as my coworker. Um, again, same thing with r different races and things like that. I think I think we need to break down those barriers, and I think that's probably one of the biggest things I've learned at Plymouth State is is how to deal with 
with different people of different backgrounds. I've worked in the student governments as a, since I was a first year student, and having those types of experiences at Plymouth State College gives you not only an example but a perspective on what you might do in you know big time politics or politics in the middle of a city. Um, Plymouth State is a, um, is a, as I've said earlier a place that gives you real life experience. It has for me. You know. And we are back here uh, at halftime with the score 14 to nothing. Um, we're going to have more halftime highlights and uh, and a look at the halftime statistics right after this timeout. Breeders' Cup is great. The most exciting thing in horse racing. Breeders' Cup is racing's biggest day. Oh, I love it. It's wonderful. This is what racing's all about. We'll take you close up and give you the best seat in the house to see the championship races and witness the championship moments. Breeders' Cup. You don't want to miss it. The best going against each other in the biggest horse racing event of the year. Watch it live Saturday, October 31st on NBC Sports. Welcome back as we get ready for this second half kick kickoff here at Courier Memorial Field in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Jay the Toe Chabot getting ready for Plymouth to kick off deep. Como is deep and is going to go over to the left-hand side, and Como chases it down and lets it roll out of bounds at about the uh, four-yard line. Is the penalty. That's where the penalty flag goes down. John Como, who has started in the... Uh, in one of the running slots in the backfield was back there to return the kickoff. Dwayne Greenidge out with a sprained ankle for the Bears, which has forced Como up into the starting lineup. Casey Linder also, a defensive back, also runs back kicks on occasion for, uh, for the Bears. But uh, the big guy in terms of kick returns has been Como. He has run back 10 coming back into the... Uh, into this season. Dwayne Greenidge, the senior from Brockton, Massachusetts, who is absent today, as we mentioned, uh, with a sprained ankle. We wish him a speedy recovery, as we do Eric Arthur, the defined defensive end from the Bears, who was injured in the first half. Uh, chop block seemed to take out his right ankle. He left the field in an ambulance and will pass on word of his condition if we get a report. The uh, Bears come out, two wideouts to the right. Looks like they're even going to open things up a little bit, and they really took control of this ball game in the second half. And Putnam stays in the game at quarterback. Here comes Khalil. Sports out of a little hole on the right-hand side. Takes it up to about the 40-yard line for about a, uh, a five-yard gain, four-and-a-half-yard gain. A nice close look at Chris Khalil right there. And you can see the potential speed he has. Luckily, uh, Plymouth was able to pull him down in this case. Take another look here. Putnam with the give to Khalil inside. And he has a little bit of room. Tries to take it outside. That's where his strength is, to take it outside. But before he could make the corner... Caraciolo. Matt Caraciolo there to pull him down was a after a gain job. of about five. Grab the back of those shoulder pads and yank you right <laughs> down. Of course, Khalil, the first running back since Warren McVay to wear number six coming out of the backfield. Putting him into, gives to Como. It goes nowhere at the 40-yard line. And uh, now it's going to be a third and six situation. Greenwall did the job there. And that is uh, one area. It's kind of an interesting game for Plymouth and in that they have had some, they've given up over 200 yards a game on the ground, John, and a lot of it, particularly in games we've seen, Norwich and Lowell, they have just been pounded inside the tackles. And today, and they've done a nice job holding a, opponents to only 42% in completion in passing, but it's been the other way around today. They've been burned by the pass and done a great job in the middle of the field. And we'll see what way Jeff Putnam goes right now with the third and six. Pizziola in the slot to the left, Brady on the right, Putnam back rolling left. And he's got Pisciola over the 50 at about the 48-yard line. He's got another first down. And Putnam really has come in and been provided a big spark for the Bears so far, John. Something that the Bridgewater State coaching staff has done throughout the year with Bob Winden and Jeff Putnam. It's almost like going with a bullpen. You go with the guy who's hot. Putnam is the guy who's been hot today. Take another look as he rolls to his left taking advantage of the sideline, gets a nice block there from uh, one of his big linemen, Brian McCarthy, and hits Piccioli, who takes it out on the sidelines for the first down at the Plymouth 47. And that is a uh, and that is a very difficult pass throwing across your body. All right, there's that reverse pitch, and this time it goes over to Khalil, who doesn't have a lot of room, and about goes down at about the 48-yard line for uh, maybe a half-yard loss on the play. Nice job by the right-hand side of that Plymouth defense. Toby Cloutier steps up here. Again, Putnam takes the pit, makes the pitch to Khalil, who's got the quickness, looking to get outside, but before he can, Toby Cloutier with great penetration pulls him down 
really for no gain, perhaps lost about a half a yard on the play. Looks like it might be second and 11 for the Bears. Plymouth pretty much starts out with the same people on defense. Doesn't look like there are any new people in in the ball game at this moment. Jim Langdon, a defensive back, actually, now that I check number four, first time we've seen him today over in the right-hand corner, has replaced P.J. Hansen. And uh, we haven't gotten any word as to what the problem is with Hansen. Uh, it's been Giard, really, on the other side, who's had the problems in the deep passes. But uh, second and ten as the Bears bring it out. Just underway here in the second half. And Putnam back to pass this time, rolling right, and throws it over the linebacker, John Morley, number 42, to Brady, Bill Brady, who kind of snuck inside into the zone. They had rolled up a zone on the right-hand side, and he's got it about the 40-yard line. One more look again. Still using the very mobile Putnam, rolling him this time to his right, his strong side. He waits, flips it over the linebacker, the leap, and into Brady's hands. He tries to turn it upfield with no luck. Picks up about seven on the play. Looks like a third and three for Bridgewater. Cloutier and DeVito on the tackle. Como and Khalil in the backfield. And they're going to go left on the wide side to Khalil, who is just tracked down. Jeff Jarry came from the left side. Penalty flag goes in there, and it looks like it's going to be a face mask. And that's a shame because that was a nice job by Jarry. I don't think he was trying to get it in there. He just dove from behind, and that's the thing his hand stuck to. Toby Cloutier with great pursuit again. Pushed Khalil upfield a little bit into the grasp of Jerry. And as Khalil was on the ground, he started making the indication for the face mask call. I don't know if uh, he may have pushed the officials a little bit more in that direction, but they did make the call. It is an inadvertent face mask that they call. Five-yard spot, but that's good enough for the first down. Another, another very uh, damaging penalty. It com just comes at the wrong time. The timing has been off. And uh, Panthers continue to make mistakes that have hurt them. This time, a virtual situation where probably Bridgewater went, would have gone for it, but at least didn't, they didn't have the first down. Now they pick up the penalty and get the first down. Langlois starts right and then goes on the left-hand side, the big tight end, first and 10. And here Putnam keeps it. Not a lot of running room, squirts ahead, uh, but big body falls up to about the 36-yard line. So let's uh, let's give them about a check that the 30. They're going to make it the 32-yard line. So the big guy picks up about three yards on first down. Big guy indeed. Putnam is 6'1", 190, sophomore out of Norwood, Mass. Looks bigger than that. Though. He does. He does. <laughs> it must be the it must be the high cleats. You know, they, for some reason they make them look taller. I don't know. The Johnny Unitas effect. Yeah, you know, they, since, uh, we're, since we're dating ourselves on quarterbacks. The scoreboard gives them only a two-yard gain, so it's second and eight. And Plymouth once again very pinched in on the defensive end. The pitch comes quickly to Como. <laughs> and he goes to the ground. Oma, not quite as quickly because he got picked up and thrown back as he tried to jump over the block by Khalil. One more time we'll watch as Como tries to launch an air attack of his own here. Takes the pitch from Putnam. Looks inside. Khalil with a chop block. Tried to go low. Recovers his balance and tries to go over the top. Unfortunately, uh, his landing was interrupted by several defenders. Carasiolo among them leaving the Bears with a third and 10. Third and 10, and Khalil came limping off uh, the field after the play. He twisted his ankle as he went into that pile, so Nguyen replaces him as the left halfback. One uh, wide outs to the right and left, Brady and Pisciola, and they throw to Brady, who catches it in the slot and falls to about the 22-yard line, and uh, it looks like they're going to move the chains again, and it's a first down for Bridgewater in a well-conceived play. Brady just broke it into the slot. One more look here. Putnam with a real quick drop. Looks to his, his left. Fires it over the top. It looks almost as though his Hanson may have lost his footing. He's down on the ground as Brady goes up to make the catch. I think that may have been a break for the Panthers in that his fall took him into Brady's path. Still enough for the first down for well, the, the Bears. First down. The Bears are on the march just under the 10-minute mark here in the third period. Bridgewater leads it 14 to nothing. Como and Nguyen, the guys in the backfield. Going to pass again. Got a penalty flag on the blitz. And it looks like number 41 blitzed in from the left side. And the linebacker, Derek Stone, a defensive back actually on the, the cornerback blitz. But penalty flag, two of them on the field. Take a look at it again. Look for uh, Stone on the left-hand side. I think we're going to take a look at it again. 
and Stone at the top of, coming in from the top of your screen. Long draw for Putnam, takes a look around the field. Oh, there comes Stone from the other direction. Takes him down nice and clean, back out at the 35-yard line. There were four green shirts coming in and only two guys there to block. Usually those odds work against your quarterbacks, I know, don't like those odds. Second and 20 for the Bears now. So Panthers get a big defensive play. They needed something like that. And now we've got another penalty flag. And it uh, looks like the officials are kind of, it was one of those where I'm not going to take it anymore type of thing. Looks, anyway. But uh, penalty, that's the earliest I think I've ever seen a penalty flag come down. It's going to be a, a five-yarder. Could be a procedure call. I'm not sure. I'd like to see some kind of an indication here. Uh, perhaps the legal procedure. Legal procedure. The, center? I, the center picked the ball up. I think he may have been positioning the strings to his liking. In this case, the center, Mark Mosher, looking for a better spot on the ball. He'll have to converse with the line judge who's putting the ball in play for him. But another five-yard penalty, second and 25 for the Bears. Got the two wideouts in the game, Johnson and Pizzioli to the left. Putnam back to 